Hi, I'm uh, Dr. John Cunha um, from Gabemda, the Greater Broward EMS Medical Directors Association. I'm also the um, Medical Director of Oakland Park EMS uh, and an emergency room doctor at Holy Cross. Um, recently, I've been asked uh, by um, many medics uh, about Flocka, which is a new um, drug that's hit the market uh, very hard in Broward County. Um, in, the, in the last uh, several months. Um, Flocka is a, a, a drug that's been causing a lot of uh, excited delirium and a lot of patient transport nightmares for crews locally. Um, so I want to give you some background on uh, Flocka. Um, the uh, PowerPoint presentation uh, will be posted on the Gabemda website um, for uh, future reference. Um, and please feel free to forward it on to all pertinent crews um, or um, people who need the medical information for taking care of patients who may have ingested Flocka. Now, one thing to remember about Flocka is it's, it seems like it's a new drug on the scene, but it's actually a, a new twist on an old favorite. What I mean by that is Flocka is a, is a bath salt or a synthetic uh, drug. Synthetic drugs are cooked up in labs. Um, they're old compounds that are changed uh, uh, or tweaked chemically so that they're not uh, listed as illegal drugs. When a, a, a drug or pharmaceutical maker uh, makes these illegal substances, they uh, have an old compound and they change it chemically to a new compound. The old compound may be an illegal drug, but the new compound is technically not illegal, and this is how they get by making new synthetic drugs. Bath salts are a great example of this. There are three or four generations now of bath salts uh, that were on the market. Then they were made illegal by the DEA, only to be changed in the lab uh, to a new substance that's not technically illegal by the, DA, by the DEA, um, but are now being sold on the street as a new drug. It's just a, a change in the chemical compound. Um, the drug makers uh, usually overseas uh, pharmacies um, or drug mills um, are usually six months to a year ahead of the American uh, DEA. Um, so these drugs have a time period where they can flood the streets and be very readily available before they're actually made illegal. Um, certain drug classes, such as the main uh, bath salts, are actually illegal um, because their um, origin drug um, is illegal. Um, so the DEA is catching up fairly rapidly to these um, drug uh, dealers and these drug um, makers, um, but they still are about six months behind for all these illegal substances. So these substances are sold as supposedly legal on the internet, on the street, in some uh, convenience stores until uh, law enforcement catches up with them. So this is a new twist on an old favorite. This is another version of the old bath salts. And bath salts became uh, notorious in the past few years for causing uh, very bad uh, delusions and um, mental uh, disturbances in patients. The other problem with these synthetic drugs is that they're often adulterated with multiple other um, medications. You can find things such as ketamine or Haldol or benzodiazepines or talcum powder uh, mixed in with these drugs. Um, because there's no um, oversight. Um, so these, these uh, synthetic drugs and bath salts, and in the case of Flocka, these sub powder substances could actually be mixed with anything. Um, and the people that are taking them very rarely know exactly what they're getting or, or know what the dose is, um, which makes these drugs even more dangerous. The word on the street, at least in the Broward uh, and Palm Beach area, is that this Flocka combination is the new crack in heroin. Now, this is appealing in several ways to the people who take these type of drugs. 
Um, one, they don't get the super high of crack and they don't get the super low with the respiratory depression of heroin, so they think they're getting a combination drug that's going to kind of find the happy medium. They'll get high enough, but not too high and low enough, but not too low so that it balances out. And this is the common myth on the street that this Flocka drug is crack and heroin or crack and meth or meth and heroin mixed together. And this is what it's been being branded as by the drug dealers on the street. Unfortunately, it's neither. Um, it is a completely synthetic compound that has some effects that are cocaine-like, some effects that are methamphetamine-like, some effects that are depressive but not as respiratory depressive as heroin. Um, but the truth is no one really knows exactly what the compounds are in these products that these uh, uh, unfortunate patients are buying. The actual flocka is also known as gravel or flocka, um, depending on how you spell it or where your local jurisdiction is. It's actually a compound called alpha PVP. Alpha PVP um, is a long chemical name um, called pyrolidinopentophenone, um, and that's the last time I'm going to say that. Um, but alpha PVP is a relation or, or a closely related drug to MDPV. MDPV was the original compound that was turned into bath salts. Um, MDPV and alpha PVP are both drugs that were known from the 60s and 70s. They were actually uh, psychoactive drugs that were tested on uh, uh, at least lab animals. I believe in the case of MDPV, they were tested on humans um, and they were found to be psychoactive drugs. They sat on the shelf or in medical textbooks or in the science literature for years and years and years until the large uh, drug pharmacies uh, found them, found that they could cook them up and have now made it into a contest of making uh, generation after generation of these illegal bath salts um, that are psychoactive drugs that they can sell until they get caught and then they sell the next one until they get caught. Now alpha PVP, uh, just like the original bath salts, are what are called nor norepinephrine dopamine reuptake inhibitors. So when you take this drug, your brain gets flooded with uh, norepinephrine and dopamine. Both of these are excitatory chemicals and cause the psychomotor agitation that you find in these patients when they take an overdose um, or even what they think is a normal dose that actually becomes an overdose. Um, the only study I could find on actual alpha PVP is a, a medical uh, veterinary drug uh, testing where they gave rats alpha PVP and it increased the dopamine in rats and increased their uh, uh, motor activity in rats. Um, so the unfortunate lab rats were happy at least uh, before the end. Um, but they had a, a very big increase in dopamine in their brains and this is what causes the psychomotor agitation. And that was the only actual scientific study I could find that documented the alpha PVP. Now there may be other studies out there, um, but um, after doing a fairly exhaustive search that was the only one I could find on the alpha PVP product. Now Flocka in, in the case of how it's taken now um, by uh, uh, drug addicts or recreational drug abusers, it's usually snorted, injected, smoked, or taken orally. There are some anecdotal uh, stories on mostly uh, drug use blogs um, that say that you can put it rectally or vaginally, um, but I wasn't able to substantiate those uh, um, only other than people anecdotally telling stories on drug blogs. And just as a quick aside, 
Um, there are multiple drug blogs you can find on the internet. If you ever want to research these drugs yourself, you can just do a simple search and there are many people talking in blogs and chat rooms about these drugs very openly um, because they're guarded by their password or they're, they're protected by their name. Um, people talk about these drugs very, very cavalierly um, and it's a very serious issue, especially in the Broward and Palm Beach County area. Anyway, um, these drugs are usually snorted, injected, smoked, or taken orally. It's a stimulant. It's used to heighten the senses. So just as people would take cocaine to heighten their senses and get a high and, and become very active, um, or take methamphetamines or uh, ecstasy to become more heightened alert, uh, heightened senses, improve concentration and focus, or how people abuse uh, Ritalin and things like that for uh, ADHD. Um, these are stimulant drugs. This makes you hyperactive, uh, more outgoing, uh, able to uh, party for a longer amount of time. Um, and that's what people try to use this drug for. In lower doses, it causes the euphoria, the heightened alertness, the improved concentration. However, in increased doses or in higher doses, this is where the problem comes in. These drugs can cause very bad excited delirium and can cause psychomotor agitation. Um, these drugs cause the patient to really lose their mind. Um, they're, they're very agitated. They have twitching. They can have seizures. They can have uh, myoclonus where their muscles get very tight. Um, they can have muscle uh, cramping. It can lead to a lot of mostly motor agitation. These patients are wiggling all over the place, flailing around, and they're in a delirious state. That um, psychomotor agitation and excited delirium is what leads to the bad uh, medical outcomes because it causes uh, the, the medical issues uh, that lead to these patients to die. Um, the uh, patients will often um, go into this delirious state. Now the delirious state, they usually don't lose their airway. Um, they usually don't do much harm to themselves, although they can be very harmful to a crew or a, a police officer on the scene. Um, the, the medical issues that kill them come downstream, either from seizures or from dehydration or from hypo, uh, sorry, hyperthermia, uh, high, uh, very high core temperature, um, or um, they go into what's called rhabdomyolysis. Rhabdomyolysis is the breakdown of your muscle tissue. If your muscles are worked to the extreme, um, let's say you run a marathon for the first time, you get some muscle soreness, some muscle tightness, and that's a buildup of lactic acid. The very far extreme of that is the muscle tissue actually breaks down and all of the myoglobin and the uh, very uh, high proteinaceous compounds that are in your muscles get washed into your bloodstream and they will muck up your kidneys and cause the kidney filtration system to not work. And this becomes a situation called rhabdomyolysis where the breakdown products of the muscles cause kidney failure, which then cause the muscle tissue uh, products to build up even higher, which then can cause uh, people to die from uh, dehydration and kidney failure. Um, so it's not the actual excited delirium unless the patient harms themselves or does something like jump off a bridge or you know confront a police officer and get shot or jump in front of a car. It's the actual downstream consequences that cause these patients to, uh, to actually expire. Now, what can you do when you come upon the scene uh, of a patient who may or may not have taken Flocka or one of the related drugs? Well, we have uh, uh, first and foremost have to take into account the crew and scene safety. Um, is it even safe to approach these people? Do they have a weapon? Um, are they imminently going to harm themselves or someone else? So that's the most important thing. 
for uh, our Gabemda protocols, we have an excited delirium protocol, which has been rolled into uh, uh, number 2.5.2, .2, the violent, impaired, and excited delirium uh, patient. Um, I'm not going to go through the protocols. You can look them up or go over them with your crews uh, so that they, they have an idea of what to do before they get on the scene. However, the main key points are the mainstay of treatment for these patients is to sedate them. The main sedating agent that most of our crews have are benzodiazepines, uh, Ativan, Versed, Valium, whichever is your uh, benzodiazepine of choice. Um, intermuscular injections, um, especially in the combative patient, are probably uh, best. If somehow you can get an IV access, they can be used IV, or there are internasal preparations of these drugs as well. Um, ketamine is a, uh, a dissociative drug that when you give it to the patient, they maintain their airway and maintain their vital signs, but they become dissociated with the situation and they almost forget to be, be combative. Um, it may be a, um, a, a good choice in these patients if you have it on your on your uh, vehicle or in your local protocols to use the ketamine um, as a adjuvant or an adjunct to the benzodiazepines or as a single uh, uh, choice. Benadryl is included in the protocols. Um, Benadryl is a great drug to help with agitation or anxiety when it's very mild, um, but do not think that giving Benadryl IM to a, a excited delirium patient is going to knock them down. Um, it's part of the protocols. It can be used as an adjunct. I often use it for patients that are mildly anxious because it's a very safe drug. It's very readily available, um, but it is not probably not to be used as a single agent um, if the patient is truly delirious. However, Antipsychotics such as Haldol can be used as single agents, and when you give Haldol, it's always a good idea to give Benadryl so that you don't get a, a uh, excess pyramidal effect from the Haldol, um, or an extra pyramidal effect from the Haldol. Um, so Haldol can be used as an antipsychotic or cogentin if it's available, um, but Benadryl can be used as an adjunct. One of the main things that you can do besides get the patient into a, a safer state of mind or a safer transportable uh, state of mind is to cool the patient if they're hyperthermic. Um, these patients may have, have other drugs on board. They may have been in an excited delirium for, for uh, minutes to hours, um, and they may be truly hypotherm hyperthermic. A patient that's very hyperthermic can start going into rhabdomyolysis, they can get dehydrated, um, and they can start actually breaking down the proteins in their body, and hyperthermia is one of the things that can cause the patient to uh, expire. So cooling the patient with uh, ice bags or whatever your cooling protocol may be, may be helpful once the patient is in a safer state of mind and, and, and uh, sedated enough to be transported. Um, especially if you have long transport times, hyperthermia is something you must definitely check for as well as uh, uh, blood sugar uh, documentation as, long as, as well as the other vital signs. Do not forget your basics with these patients. Don't pat yourself on the back once you get them knocked down and forget to check the rest of their vital signs and a 12 lead and their blood sugar and all the other protocols that you have to follow with altered mental status. Now, the last bullet point, Baker Act uh, facility, if necessary or applicable. This is a touchy subject because most of these patients will be taking these drugs recreationally. They won't be taking them to harm themselves, and it may be impossible for you to figure it out. Now, Baker Act facilities may be better off for these patients um, if they're not very delirious. However, medically, I would advocate that these patients should be treated medically not psychiatrically, and that because the medical problems will occur later on as far as the rhabdomyolysis or renal failure or things like that, that they should be medically cleared and medically treated and medically stabilized. 
um, especially before they're put into a jail situation or put directly into a psychiatric uh, situation because these patients, while their excited delirium is taken care of right away, their medical issues can linger uh, further.